dailies this morning covered their story quite widely and painting us a picture of some of the victims and the families that have been affected. We're told in Kericho County, three children died in two separate incidents where mudslide hit Skip Kelly on West on Monday evening, while in Migori, a 28-year-old woman and her two children died when their houses caved in. The woman and the children were asleep in their house in Koban estate in Migori town when tragedy struck. One of the children survived and was rushed to Migori level 4 hospital and the local communities in the, some of these areas for example in Nyando Kisumu county that was unaffected have offered to host the victims of uh, this um, of the of the flooding and the mudslides and when you look at the pictures there they paint clearly a desperate situation that has unfolded owing to mother nature but from Elvis's uh, story also we play a part in this because some of these areas are not fit for human activities that actually put them in danger so um to delve deeper into how the weather affects us and how we can actually brace for this season, all the while trying to protect ourselves from uh, the spread of COVID-19, is Patricia Nyinguru has, is joining me to have this conversation. She is the principal meteorologist, uh, Climate Services. Welcome to the show, Patricia. Thank you for indulging us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So, Patricia, could you tell us at this time of the year, this is, these are weather patterns, what are we to expect? And, I mean, why is it that these weather, what the, what's happening with the climate is resulting in such devastation in certain parts of the country? Well, we are in the peak of the March to May rainfall season. Yes. And when we issued the forecast for April, mm -hmm. we indicated that most parts of the country were expected to receive above average rainfall. Yes. Okay, so right now yeah. there seems to be, uh, while the disaster, there is the above average rainfall, but then it is being coupled by some other elements. Could you tell us, for example, in Ngeo Marraquit and in the escarpment, what is it about this area that makes, coupled with the above average rainfall, that makes it quite dangerous and resulting in the loss of lives? Mm -hmm. Well, this regions are regions that are quite slopey and hilly okay and uh, generally these regions are more prone to landslides and mudslides as opposed to the more flatter regions mm -hmm. yeah so when we have a lot of rainfall like we had expected and we had issued an advisory about mm -hmm. we have a couple of days of high rainfall amounts and then the earth gets saturated and then the soils can no longer hold the amount of water that is in it and therefore that is why we see the land shifting and we have landslides and mudslides okay and what i can see also flooding and you know some of the people are being caught up in that but the question would be isn't there a warning system um while we the, the announcement is being made by the uh, your department when it comes to the common monarchy at the grassroots level for example the mother who was asleep they basically don't get or do even if they get that information through the media they don't really understand what it means and what danger that increased rainfall poses for them so how come you don't find this information trickling down to the grassroots actually it does trickle down yeah. because um, we have um, county directors of meteorology in all the counties mm -hmm. And for example, in the West Pokot region, the county director for Lodwa County got right. this information mm. and then he downscaled it. And then he was able to disseminate it using local media in the local language. Okay. So, yeah, so people are able to get the uh, warning that there would be heavy rainfall. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge is most likely most of them do not know how to react or what to do in view of the rainfall that is expected. Mm -hmm. And that is where I feel complementarity between different government services can mm -hmm. be put in place to be able to safeguard lives. 
Okay, and particularly in West Pokot, this is not the first time this year that we are having a disaster of that nature. We had one a few months ago of similar nature, mudslides, and they're taking uh, taking lives, and people are displaced. What is it about this area that it, what is the economic activity, if I if I may ask, that would um, place these people in a in a situation where they feel that they need to stay in these areas, but at the same time, when the downfall downpour comes in, it really puts their lives in danger. I think a lot of these uh, people who live in these regions live in ancestral land. So okay. they live on land that has been passed down from generation to generation. And so it becomes a bit difficult for them to move and go to different regions. Mm -hmm. And also, um, in the report that your journalist had given, um, he said there's a lot of farming that is going on, which is quite true. Yes. And most people farm on the slopes of the, of the mountains. So this kind of uh, weakens or um, undermines the integrity of the soil within those slopey regions, because mm -hmm. they cut down trees to be able to farm. And the roots of the trees are the ones that hold the soil firmly together. Yeah. So when there is no that hold or the roots are no longer there, when a lot of water comes, such as what we witnessed from the heavy rainfall, then the landslides occur. Okay, is there a way that they could have their cake and eat it? Is, uh, maybe you know of places in the world where they are put in measures whereby they can still stay on the mountain sides, do their farming, but at the same time implement solutions that make it so that they can actually survive when the weather changes or takes such uh, drastic turns and not cost them their lives. I think the best solution is finding the correct balance between coexisting with the environment right. and being able to carry out their own economic activities. Yeah, mm -hmm. We all know that uh, cutting down of trees has a lot more impacts than just resulting in landslides and mudslides. Mm -hmm. So if uh, the communities could be educated about the dangers of cutting trees and probably just prevent them from doing that mm -hmm. and giving them alternative land for which they can be able to farm, that should be able to help them to earn their livelihood, earn their food, but at the same time conserve the environment. Okay, the, uh, I, I was reading an article a few days ago about how this, if you take a look at the f past few decades, the number of people that have been lost is um, could uh, actually be upwards of 500 owing to weather and climate changes or certain patterns that we are not really shifting to adopt to. I mean. Does that op doesn't that open a conversation between the meteorological me department and the government on better ways of handling? I mean, you can do more than just give the alerts, right? Perhaps advice, perhaps um, uh, open up a conversation that will in elicit change in how we handle this type of thing instead of just every year seeing, you know, people losing their lives. Yeah, you're actually very right. Um, in the most, more recent years, we are seeing more erratic weather patterns. We have heavier rainfall, we have, uh, we have droughts happening uh, more frequently. Mm -hmm. And this is because of the changing climate, which is happening globally. And it's yeah. a discussion that is already being had at both national level and even international levels. Mm. So when we issue advisories, we do not just issue them to the public only. We also issue them to pertinent ministry, line ministries. Mm -hmm. For example, the National uh, Disaster Operations Center, they are on our mailing list, the Red Cross, all these ministries that can be able to use the information that we provide to be able to safeguard lives. Because that is our main mandate, mm -hmm. providing early warning to be right. able to safeguard lives and to protect property. Okay, and perhaps could you mention some of the studies from other parts of the world that have been able to handle this type of thing uh, adequately that we could actually borrow from and ensure that our people are not suffering the way they are right now? The most immediate and most uh, effective thing right now is to stop encroaching on um, the environment. Right. Like stop cutting down trees, especially in slopey regions. Because it directly affects the climate of our region. And um, so if we can be able to educate the local people and give them al alternatives for them to do that, mm -hmm. then it can be useful in helping us to mitigate climate change and also to adapt to the changes that we already have seen. 
Yeah, Absol absolutely. And when we look at now the fallout, because right now the people who have been displaced, those who are grieving, those who have lost their li livelihoods, their homes, their loved ones, there are also aftermaths to um, certain disasters when there are floods in an area or where the, there are mud yeah. mudslides. What are some of the other dangers that come in when you are put in that type of environment and the living situation is not ideal? Well, um, generally when we have a lot of flooding, we have stagnant water that stays in a, in a place for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. This gives rise to diseases like waterborne diseases. And it also um, creates a perfect habitat, for example, for mosquitoes to continue breeding. Yeah. So there are a lot of issues that are also related yeah. to, to the floods. Mm -hmm. um, in some areas, we find contamination of uh, piped water by the stagnant flood water. Okay. And so people end up drinking or using this water that is contaminated, that is dirty, mm -hmm. and therefore it brings health complications. Therefore, so there really is yeah. a lot that... Um, mm -hmm. No, go on, it's okay, it's okay. Oh yeah. So I was saying there's really a lot that can we can lose from not paying attention to these advisories and not safeguarding our own lives. So for me the key would be when we issue the advisory and we disseminate it as widely as we can, especially to the government ministries, right. that people should be able to put their lives or, or rather to value their lives more mm -hmm. than their livelihood. Mm -hmm. So how would you advise coping after if that is within your expertise? How would you advise local governments to, in, to help people cope with this particular possible eventualities of disease and all the things that you have mentioned? Like right now, when we issue the advisories, we are really putting emphasis on moving from the regions that still are prone to landslides. Okay. We issued an advisory on Monday mm -hmm. that goes all the way up to 25th, and we still are expecting heavy rainfall in those regions as right. well as parts of the coastal region of the country. Right. Yeah. So if people can be evacuated, of course, with the help of the government, mm -hmm. that would go a long way in safeguarding their lives. Yeah, and our conversation has really centered on West Pokot and El Geo Market, but then there's the lake side that's also experiencing this type of um, uh, eventualities, flooding, and of course, people being displaced. What is it about the lake side, and what would you say to the locals there about how they should act right now in lieu of the increased rainfall right now? So most of the Lake region or uh, Lake Victoria region is generally flat ground. Yes. And so when we have a lot of rainfall, we have consecutive days of rainfall, then we have water um, being collected in one place. Yeah. And for many years, we have heard of the Budalangi region having a lot of flooding. Mm. But nowadays, we don't really hear of them uh, being in crisis because they put uh, measures to be able to cope with that. Mm -hmm. uh, flood protection is one of the things that they put in place. Yes. So we continue to encourage uh, residents in those regions to, uh, if your region is prone to flooding, if it is possible to move, that is the best option for you. Mm -hmm. But once again, I say this will only work if we have uh, complement, if this information we give is complemented by efforts by the local government right. and national government as well. Yes, wonderful. But then there's also the danger of flash floods. Tell us about that because these do not come with warnings. Actually, they happen way off in other areas that haven't even experienced the rains. What are some of the areas that should be on the lookout for that and what must they do? So all the regions along the Tana River are also at risk of flooding because we have um, upstream rainfall. Uh -huh. And like you had mentioned, when, it, when flash floods happen, it's not that it had necessarily rained in those regions. So it rains upstream and then the water flows down and becomes a flash flood. Mm -hmm. So um, along Tana River, we would also like to advise people to move if you see fast moving waters, it is safer to move away from them to avoid wading through those waters right. and stay safe until the flood waters have passed. Okay, and perhaps if we are going to paint a picture of the hot spots right now during this rainy seasons, what would your what would your antenna be very focused on in the country right now? 
Well, I will base my answer on the latest rainfall advisory that we gave. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, valid from 21st to 25th April. And the regions that were um, highlighted include coastal region, Kwale, Kilifi, Mombasa, Lamu, Tana River, Northeastern, Wajia, Masabit, Taita Taveta. Right. Um, within central Kenya, Nairobi, right. Nyeri, Kiambu, Nyandara, and Muranga, which already has landslides. Mm -hmm. Within western Kenya, we had Busia, Kisi, Nyamira, Kericho, Narok, Migori, and also of um, Kisumu, Bungoma, Homa Bay, Kakamega, and Nakuru. So generally, most parts of the country are receiving heavy rainfall yes. because we're in the peak of the rainfall season. April is actually the peak of yeah. the rainfall season. Mm -hmm. Now, aside from that, when it comes to urban centers, because the areas that we have seen um, much devastation would be, you know, they seem to be far removed, remoter areas of the country. How about urban areas in Nairobi? Should we be afraid right now? Well, Nairobi was part of the counties that were listed as uh, being areas of concern for yes. flooding. Mm -hmm. And the main, re the main reason for flooding in urban regions is that there is lack of a lot of soil for percolation of the rainfall water. Uh -huh. So we have a lot of pavements, we have a lot of tarmac, and so there is no, the water has nowhere to go. And so that is why we see a lot of uh, flooding, especially in valleys within the within the um, city. city. Yeah. Yeah. So especially in den densely populated um, places, like in the downtown parts uh -huh. of Kileleshwa that are maybe hilly. Mm -hmm. So at the valleys, we see a lot of water collecting, and that is because we do not have soil for the rainfall water to percolate. Okay. So still within Nairobi residents are expected to be on the lookout. Okay, and as we conclude the conversation, I would like us to talk solutions. Far from that, there's also the problem of, uh, you know, um, food security, insecurity rather, the need for uh, irrigation in certain areas, and then the fact that we are often having rainfall and we're often having flooding, but then mechanisms for water storage are not as optimum as we love them to be. What would you say about that? Well, as the Med Department, for a couple of years now, we have really been trying to encourage people to embrace water harvesting. Mm -hmm. And this is because as the rainfall patterns become even more erratic, we expect to see more heavy rainfall events, yeah. followed by longer periods of dry, dry, of dryness, of no rainfall. Okay. So if farmers cannot be able to rely on the rainfall patterns to produce their food, then water harvesting comes in handy because it extends the period that they can be able to grow. If they had harvested water, they can use it for irrigation. Mm -hmm. So we really try to encourage farmers, especially in regions that don't have very good rainfall, yeah. to harvest when the rainfall occurs. And this doesn't have to be so elaborate or the infrastructure isn't very expensive. Just buying a big tank that you can be able to drain water from your roof, mm -hmm. this can be sufficient. Or digging a hole in the ground and then lining it with plastic okay. can be able to help you to, save, to um, harvest water. But that's, that's at a personal, individual level. What can the government do to ensure that this happens on a larger scale that actually impacts and changes uh, whole communities rather than just individual farmers or people living in certain areas? Even subsidies on yeah. water harvesting infrastructure can be quite a good incentive for farmers because I'm sure tanks are expensive, especially for a subsistence farmer who's not farming to sell. Yes. But if the tanks were subsidized and it was cheaper and they could be able to afford or there was a payment plan that they could tap into, then this should be able to help. And this can only be done if the government sees the need and is able to protect their citizens in that way. Mm -hmm. And is there a specific type of farming that is ideal for certain areas? Let's take the lake basin when they go towards the rice and what have you. Are there specific planting patterns that could actually aid in the problem or take advantage of larger rain quantities at this time of the year? Mm -hmm. 
Well, the Ministry of Agriculture would be best qualified to speak about that. But what I know is that our country is not uniform in terms of agroecological zones. So there are different uh -huh. crops that can be grown in different regions and that cannot survive in another region. Uh -huh. So the lake basin, the, the plains are very useful for rice farming because it's flat and it allows for water to stagnate in that region. Yeah. So they can be able to benefit from heavy rainfall. But when it becomes too much again, then it submerges their crop. Okay. And so then it brings about other issues. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Probably, um, in yeah. areas with less rainfall. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. It's okay. Yeah, I was saying in areas with uh, less rainfall, we try to encourage farmers also to work with the uh, local agricultural people to enable them to choose crops or to choose seed species that um, do not need a lot of rainfall to be able to survive the entire season. And if they cannot do that, then water harvesting is their next best option. Okay. And now, would you, I mean, as we are finishing off, would you say that it's, uh, this is going to be happening for a while now, the devastation that we're seeing, people trying to flow to their animals? I mean, what would you say, that, in terms of timelines, what would you say uh, we should be looking forward to in the next few weeks? Well, as we go into the month of May, we will be heading towards the cessation of the rainfall season, and mm -hmm. therefore we should expect a bit of a reprieve in terms of uh, rainfall amounts that we will expect. But for the next week, uh, based on the forecast that we had given on Monday, we still expect um, heavy rainfall over most parts of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so every Monday we produce a weekly forecast, and at the end of the month we will produce a monthly forecast. So this will be able to give better guidance on what we expect. But May is the cessation of the rainfall season. Mm -hmm. And perhaps for those who do not know, how could you reiterate, please, how they could actually find this information and be sure that they act accordingly and be safe before disaster strikes? For those who are able to access social media, we are on both Facebook, um, Twitter and Instagram. Um, our handle is Kenya Met. Especially on Twitter, we put out a lot of information. We also have a website. Uh, if you Google Kenya Meteorological Department, you can right. be able to get up-to-date information mm -hmm. on the weather forecast as well as advisories. And within the counties, we have county directors of metrology, and they are able to downscale the national forecast to their localities. So they also send this information through WhatsApp groups that they have within the counties. Mm -hmm. So we really are trying to get the information out there and um, yeah, people can access it through those means. Thank you very much, Patricia. Nyinguro is a principal metrologist at the Climate Services. Thank you so much for that detailed uh, you know, in analysis of what to expect, how we are being affected, and what to do with the excess rain that we're experiencing right now. Now, we're going to take a short break. When we come back on the other side, we'll be bringing you news and reviews from the local scene and international scene. Do not go too far. You're watching Morning Express.